But right now, we just want to just welcome everybody here to IGO Church and Ministry Training Center. And right now, I want to introduce you to us, uh, not only just our first lady, but the woman of God. Amen. The pastor's wife. Amen. But Pastor Miss Cheryl. Amen. Come on, give it up for the first lady of the house. Amen. Amen. And we praise is what we do, Lord, because it's all, it's all about him, isn't it? It's all about you, Lord. Amen. Hey, Theo, come on down. We have a, we have a uh, testimony, kind of an awesome testimony. And today is going to be Lord's Supper. So everybody, I want you to start getting your hearts right. Amen. Come on. Remember what he did for us. My gosh, I wouldn't be standing here. I remember when we met, how messed up we were. Look what God can do. Look what he can do. Woo, he's able. So Theo and I were talking the other day, and Theo and his wife, Vanessa, how long have you guys been coming? We've been coming here for about three years now. Is that all? It seems longer. Well, for me, three years, but her, she's been here since she was little. Oh, yeah, yeah. And how far do you travel? We travel about two hours to get here every morning, <laughs> every Sunday. Yeah, we have a, how many travel at least 30 minutes to get here? Because we have a lot, of, look at this. We have a lot of people that travel. Hallelujah. Awesome. Come on, come on. You go ahead and you share the testimony you shared with me. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I've, uh, I've been coming here for about three years now. And uh, I mean, this is the first church I can say that has really changed my life. Uh, I got, I've usually, uh, I usually I come to church and uh, you know I went through the motions and this is the first church where I actually listened to what the man of God and what the people around here said and uh, it's like this is a church where everybody's actually true to what they uh, believe they actually act on it like uh, I don't know if you guys do March for Life uh, we're doing that uh, Friday uh, we act on what we talk about and that's a real blessing for us <laughs> and uh, it's just uh, we, when we first started I, I remember I was a uh, I came back down to Atlanta and I was, I was sleeping in my car just to get to work and everything. And uh, I just kept, we just kept paying tithes, we kept being faithful. We had the Rutgers do our marriage counseling, by the way. We weren't married when we first came here. We had child of wedlock and we just had it. We just tried to get everything together. And uh, we just kept tithing, we kept working hard and staying true to the word. And uh, promotions came out of nowhere. I said, Gav, you're going to keep me here. I, I didn't mean in a, in a mean way. I said, God, you're going to keep me here. You're going to have to bless me. Help me. If you want me to stay here, bless me. He blessed me with promotions, own promotions, and it just God just helped me so tremendously. Oh, so, so how long have you been here, girl? Um, I've been here since I was in seventh grade, actually. Yeah, it was an Easter service. And after that, my whole family, we dragged them here. And so we've been here ever since. Um, my brother... It's been here and it's kind of made him grow up and my whole family has kind of grown up in this household. So it's been, this house has been really faithful to my family. And so it's only right to be faithful back to God's house. And Danilo, if you in January, they're down in Florida. If you guys are live streaming, hello. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah, thank you, you guys. You guys are such a blessing. That just blesses the socks, blesses my husband. Yes. Yeah, we should have had you doing pop-ups today, next week. Amen. Hey, Deborah, you were going to share a little something. Another woman that's being used here in the ministry, Deacon. Now, you guys used to travel, and then you got sick of it and decided to move closer, didn't you? No, we always, uh, when we moved here, we moved from Gary, Indiana to Atlanta, to Marietta, Georgia, by the direction of the Holy Spirit. By the direction of the Holy Spirit, the Lord led us here. And, um, you know, we just, when we, the first time we came here, we just felt at home. You know, it was similar to what we left, except, you know, of course, we had more of a prophetic edge here than we had at home, you know, no, uh, but we love our man of God that we had at home. But coming here was sort of like leaving high school, coming to college, you know, <laughs> you know, and, and going from college as we've been here, you know, we've gone, from, we've done college and now we're in the extended education for masters and doctorates and all that sort of thing, you know. So we have grown up here. Um, my husband and I have been members of this house um, I think this year will make 17 years, 17 years uh, in February. 
Amen. So, you know, I, I, I grew up here in the, in the spirit. You know, I mean, I learned, I had a good foundation back at home that I didn't really know that I had until I got here. And the Lord began to grow me up here. And so now, uh, as a member here, I'm, I'm a deacon, praise the Lord. You know, um, I get the opportunity, Pastor. We do use women. Yes, <laughs> they do use women. Amen. You know, every now and then I get the opportunity, the privilege, the blessing to share, you know, what's on my heart. Or uh, if I've given assignment to share, you know, I get the opportunity to speak to God's people, you know, under the leadership of the man and woman of God. So uh, my husband and I, we also serve in the meet and greet. Um, as uh, Brother Theo said, you know, we had the privilege of um, speaking into some of the husbands and wives' lives here, you know. Um, you know, I usually start off saying, I don't have anything to say, I don't have anything to say. And then in the counseling session, I'm probably doing most of the talking, <laughs> you know. So God has really grown us up here, and I consider it a privilege and an honor. And I thank God for allowing me to be used right here at home in Jesus' name. Am, am I on? Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Deborah. You're a blessing. And by the way, Theo and Vanessa travel all that way and they serve. Isn't that awesome? Just serving in the body. It's real important to find a place to serve because that's your connection and it'll keep you kind of steady when sometimes you feel like, ah, I can't do this anymore. No, yes, you can because you're an usher <laughs> or you're in children or you're the pastor. Yes. <laughs> hey, Marchmans, how long have you guys been here? Because you were across the street with us. Going on 26 years. Wayne and Deb Marchman. Awesome. I love the Lord's Supper days. I mean, I just love the Lord's Supper. If you know, when I share, I share sometimes that when I'm on kind of vacation by myself, because pastor comes back to do a service, and I go, can I stay another four days, please? And I'll do the Lord's Supper and just walk, whether it's a river or the beach, and just let God speak to me, and I get such breakthroughs. So let God speak to you today. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, Donnie. Thank you for his, your prayers. He was really hurt. His knees were really hurting this week. Well, hallelujah. Hey, saints, everybody better. all right? Amen. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I don't normally share dreams. But I want to share a little bit of insight because, you know, I've been under a bit of an assignment with my legs, right? God will give them back to me, but, I, you know, it's a humbling experience not being able to lift a leg. I mean, that's crazy. And so the other night, about four o'clock, I was sort of in, in the zone somewhere. And uh, it, was like I, it was like I was in a room. And, and it was not a familiar room. It was more like a, a hotel setting or a motel setting or something. And there was somebody in the room with me that, that I knew, but didn't, I couldn't place their face. I couldn't, give, I couldn't tell you who it was name-wise. But it was somebody that I know that I had known in the past and someone who was interested in me for whatever reason. What up? Oh, thanks, darling. Please sit down, sweetheart. It's got my wife down so she doesn't stand next to me up there. Thank you. And so uh, it was an uncomfortable feeling. It, Although I wasn't quite sure why that person was there, and I'll explain it to you a little later. And then as I sat there, it was like there was a, a, a communication going on, but it wasn't heart to heart. It was more like this person was trying to probe inside my head. Do you understand? It's like an interrogation, but presenting themselves as, as a friend or an associate. Then all of a sudden, I couldn't see that face of the person anymore. But I started hearing this very strange sound, a little bit like that fan motor that went out the other day. But it was the sound of a, like an animal that was dying and it was screeching and wailing, you know, like when they slaughter a pig or they slaughter an animal, that high-pitched squeal. Well, this went on for a while and so all of a sudden that image was kind of back sort of over here. And I said, what was that? And there was no answer. I said, do you know what that was? It's weird. It's, it's unsettling. Still no answer. And then all of a sudden that was gone. The image was gone. And I could sense that person was behind me. And the noise had stopped. But now I could hear a similar noise behind me. But it was very muffled. And I said, do you have any idea what that is? 
and the voice changed pitch. Now instead of like a, a semi-male voice, it was a, almost like a high-pitched young girl's voice. And I said, do you know who it is? And the voice said, no. I said, are you sure? No. I said, who are you? No answer. And I was feeling very troubled. It, it wasn't like I was in the room with a friend. And I put my hand behind me to f see this person or feel this person. Oh, freak out. But what I felt was the jaw of an animal. But it wasn't a regular jaw, like a dog jaw or a, or a, or a goat. It was an elongated jaw with teeth. And I didn't understand that until later. And I said, why are you here? No answer. So I asked again. I said, in the name of Jesus the Christ, why are you here? And the voice said, I'm sent to kill you. I'm sent to destroy you. One or the other. And then I woke up and there was like a, you know these old horror movies where you see a black cape does that? I woke up. And when I opened my eyes, I could see the ceiling fan go around. I saw like a black cape sort of waft around and it was gone. Now things like that don't normally get to me, but I, I got my little flashlight out. And I put my flash on and see if there was some entity in the room. Nothing. And later on I asked the Lord, what, what is, what was that? And it says you were told. And people that read the Bible, you read things like, um, they misunderstand things like Jezebel, all right? They misunderstand that spirit altogether. It can be in a man as well as a woman. And if you ever want me to teach on those subjects, I will. Just buckle your seatbelt. Because, you know, Jesus made mention of the Jezebel spirit in Revelation 2.20. And he said the fact that the people did, they, they had everything going for them except they were allowing someone in their midst that was causing problems. And he identifies them. But anyway, the thing that I felt when I felt this, it was a jaw. It was like, and later on, I got, the, I got this incident that, that the jaw was that of a crocodile. It's a crocodile jaw. And of course, you know, a lot of people talk about Leviathan, all right? But Leviathan just simply means a sea beast. But it actually refers back to Egypt, talking about the Egyptian crocodile, which is one of the biggest, the Nile crocodile. And the way it attacks and bites and holds on and then twists. And so somewhere along the line, people got the idea, oh yes, that people have a lying spirit, it's a Leviathan spirit. It's not, not so, but for the sake of explanation, we will help you connect the twisting with the issue that's happening, which is a lack of communication. And between my wife and myself, between you and me, the enemy's desire is to twist the truth so that you, see when a crocodile attacks and bites or, or a, in Australia, we have the big saltwater crocs. Same, same method of killing. They, they attack, they grab, and then they begin to twist. And then sometimes take it down and stick it under a, a log or something until it rots, right? But the whole idea is hold on, don't let go, and twist your, your enemy or twist your prey until it's no longer able to survive. It can't breathe anymore. And it in a person's life, it's misunderstanding of what's being communicated to you. You ever, you ever see the movie Cool Hand Luke? And you remember the, the, the warden, when he's speaking to the actor, he says, what we have here is a failure to communicate. Do you remember that? And he proceeded to beat the heck out of him. Well, ministries can't beat their congregation. Do you understand what I'm saying? It wouldn't go down very well. But you've got to understand what ministries like IGO do. We don't go from the inside out. This, this is not a group of worldly people observing how the church does things. It's the other way around. It's, it's the body of Christ observing how the world does things so they can avoid doing it the way they do. You've got to understand that when, when you're in a black and white house, I'm not talking skin color, get away from that silly, racist, stupid stuff. When you get into a house where the Word of God has to be preached as the foundation for life, there's no gray zones. God does not see gray. He sees grace. He sees compassion. He sees mercy. He sees forgiveness. But it's like, you know, if you ask the Father, Father, what is your Word? What is the reality? What is your truth regarding this? They asked Jesus. He said, I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. 
You can't make it to God or to the kingdom except by and through me. In other words, the words that I speak, they are life. And they're given to me by God. So if you want life, study my words, not the words of the world. Right? So if we're going to help you see from the perspective of God, that's what a prophetic minister, help you see from the perspective of God, sometimes it can be a little bit invasive. Sometimes you go, I didn't get saved until I was 29 years old and I was a very bad boy. I didn't have the benefit of being raised in a church home with mum and dad that spoke in tongues. Mum and dad didn't even speak, let alone in tongues. I was raised by my mother. I had a brother nine years older than I. And so, you know, when I was released, when I finished my college, high school, what we call college, we call them different things. But we had, I had 15, 14 and a half years of education, of school education. I could have gone into university, which is what you call college, but I was too busy wanting to get out there and live life, you know. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So I left home when I was 16 with my mother's blessing. See ya, bye. And I proceeded to go with a mate of mine over into Europe. And we traveled around Europe and bummed around in a car that had a hole in the roof and had flat tires. The engine blew up in Sweden. We had a terrific time. Well, at that age, you don't mind about things like that. How many people do you know that the, the, the head gasket blows up in their old car that they bought and you get towed to a, a, to a shutdown ski resort with a team of reindeer? That's exactly, we're stuck in a snowstorm and an old reindeer farmer came and hooked up the front of the car and towed us to a, a ski resort that was not yet open. It was a terrible place. It was, it was, it was filled with all kinds of cooks and chefs and about 500 women all in there serving and we were all, <laughs> two guys. It was the greatest thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I had, we had to force each other to leave. When they opened up, they said, sorry, we're opening next week and we charge $150 a day. And said, you kidding? <laughs> we don't have enough for three, three hours. So they said, see ya. So we left. But all of these th things that happened to me formed in me a certain kind of a character. This kind of character, this kind of character. Unfortunately or fortunately, you have a very similar character. I, I know I'm going to say things that are going to hurt people's feelings. You've got one in the, in the United States office. POTUS is a, is a depersonality. He says things before he, he thinks about them. But the good that comes out of what he does for the general populace will be proven to be far more important than his nasty way of putting things. And, you know, it, I, I've spent a lot of time in Haiti. He described it very crudely. Actually, even though he has a great education, he's a terrific businessman, he, he's, he's a man's man, he's a kind of a crude man. He is. So I don't know why people such take joy in judging him, but they do. Uh, and the self-righteousness that's oozing out of a lot of people today, uh, they don't see, they, don't, they fail to see the good that comes out of who he is. Now I believe, you don't have to believe this, I believe that God put him into that office. Because now he's using the name of Jesus. Oh, look at the way he speaks. Look at the way he talks. But, but also listen to his heart. Listen to his heart. And the other day I made, I made some comment. that I, Unfortunately, I offended a few people because they misunderstood my heart. When I talk to this congregation or those folks out there in the internet world, I'm talking from the perspective of one who is trying with all of my heart to give you the benefit of the last 35 years of my life. And also the fact that it's like the Apostle Paul said, I know a lot of you don't like me or don't like what I do. But basically paraphrasing, he said, take it up with God because he called me. Amen. And so, it, you know, if you have a problem with what I'm doing, it may be in the delivery. But check the heart and check the, check the resource, check the source of what I'm saying. Because if it's God, you'll find yourself fighting against God. What I'm trying to do now is not draw accusation against the body of Christ or against the ladies in the body of Christ. What I'm trying to do is get you to see what the world system is pushing in the way of an agenda so that you guys can help other people protect themselves against what Satan is trying to do to this world system, which is demean women. All right? And at the same time, the demeaning of women is taking place in a whole different way than you think. The demeaning of the woman is taking place by causing them to feel as if they are being robbed of their rights. But in fact, they are being robbed of their rights. 
but they're trying to come back and overcome that lack by rising up in the flesh. Are you listening to me? When I talk about, about families, about husbands and wives, the scripture doesn't talk, it's not about man and woman thing. When, when the Spirit of God is, is on the Apostle Paul in particular, talking about women and marriage and husbands, and even refers back to Eve and the Garden of Eden, he's talking about a husband and a wife, not just a man and a woman. The covenant of marriage was established by God in the garden. It was broken because of the enemy taking advantage of one of the very finer qualities of women, which is their, their desire to feel things and emotionally connect with things. Men don't emotionally connect with things except perhaps motor cars and food. But, 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 but it won't, when it comes to women, it's a covenant thing, see? And so for the husband love their wives as Christ loved the church and the woman to adapt herself under her own husband, these are very positive traits where Paul is reminding folks. When, when he talks about man and a woman, he's not talking about the world. When I talk to you about husbands and wives and, and, and what the strategy of Satan is as far as elevating women to overthrow the man, I'm not talking about Christian men and Christian women. When I say that it's not a good idea for women to rule over men, it's, it says in the scripture, that's talking about husband and wife. Paul says it's not good for a, for a woman to talk over a man or take authority over her husband, but rather ask him questions at home. If you got, see, now, these are not negative things. These are to, to cease the opportunity of Satan to get in and cause disruption or breakage or disconnection between the covenant of marriage. It's designed to make sure that the wife is used to support her husband, not tear him down in the presence of other people. Now, a lot of people don't understand that. So, all right, what about the authority? You talked about a woman president. Yes, I did. But in that case, if it happened to be a woman with God's hand on her, hallelujah, I'll vote for her. But it happens to be a woman that's, that, that's, that's worldly or has spiritual influences at operation in her life, whether she's clever or not. I'm not going to vote for that person and I want you to be aware of the enemy's strategy of putting people into places of authority where they can cause damage. Do we understand my heart? This is not a black thing, white thing. This is not about Oprah Winfrey. She's a very talented woman. Is she a spirit-filled child of God? I don't know, but I don't think so, not by what I've been watching and hearing. I can't judge it or criticize it. All I can do is observe. I can't tell you how to manage your life. Or how to, I'm not going to get between a husband and a wife. That's between you two. We talked about, you know, dressing in a way which doesn't attract predators. That's common sense, isn't it? Now, we say, well, you're saying it's all right for someone to attack a woman because of the way she's dressed. No, no, no. I'm not saying that. I'm saying for Christian husbands, Christian wives to instruct their children to dress appropriately when you're in the public. Now, more especially now, my brothers and sisters, because there's a spirit of rape and murder that's out there and they are targeting your sweet little daughters. I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. So if your daughters are so lacking in, a, in an understanding of who they are, that they want to dress like the cosmos, dress like the unsaved, dress like those who have no walk with God, you're going to attract those people who target you because you are dressed in a manner that calls you bait. They think you're bait. Do you understand that? Yes. Now, if, you, if, if, if someone says to me, well, you're condoning the fact that a, a person, this is insensitive to call somebody, you know, a, a, a victim because they were dressed in a certain manner and they got attacked by a man. I'm not saying, God forbid, and I'm not saying that's a, that's, it's not a horrible thing to happen to anybody. What I'm saying is from a a man of God, or from God's perspective, don't let your daughters out of the house when they're dressed in a way which is going to get the attention of men in an incorrect manner. That's what I'm saying. Now, if you don't want, wait a minute, if you don't want to do that, if your daughter, you think, I want my daughter to dress any way she wants and nobody has the right to attack her, you're absolutely right. But why would you put your, 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 your little chicken in a fox house? Right, dress, dress nice, dress cute, dress pretty, awesome. You know, I'm not against slacks or any of that kind of stuff. That's fine. But what I'm trying to say is I'm trying to protect you is all I'm trying to do. And I'm trying to get you to see that the world system is spiraling downwards. 
the spirits that are infle- inf- in influencing a lot of the young men today is not one that you should feel comfortable with your daughters being around. You've got to watch over them because they don't know. Say, well, it's my right for my... It is, absolutely. If you want your daughter to get out there with a dress that's hiked up her rear end, that's entirely up to you. If you ask my opinion, I'm going to give it to you. But if you don't want my opinion, I'll butt out. But I'm just trying to defend you against a system right now that is targeting weakness. And it's targeting, in, and especially the body of Christ. I hope you understand my heart. Now, we've got a leadership meeting later on. I'm going to explain a lot of these things biblically to them. But please trust me and have confidence in that I'm not here to pull you down or make women feel insecure or inadequate or in any way less than a man. There's neither male nor female in the Spirit of God. You know that. I've taught you that. But if I can sense things headed a certain way because of the gifting that God gives me, I'm going to share that with you. If you don't want me to share those things with you, and I stop teaching them to you, then please don't blame me if things begin to happen and you don't understand why. For years and years and years, women have been safe. Now they're no longer safe. We made such progress in interacting different races and incorporating different races. But the enemy is stirring up racism every which way he can. And it's not about the color of your skin. It's about the origin of the spirit that's either controlling you or not controlling you. I want you to look at 2 Peter chapter 3 and hear what Peter has to say about this. Because this lack of communication is causing problems. Now the other day, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 14 through 16. The other day I was looking... <coughs> through an article and I came across Pastor uh, Yosef who is the senior pastor and founder of a church that you may have seen down here the Church of the Apostles big old brick building there he's married to an Australian woman so there's got to be good in him <laughs> and he came across this which is a quote that he used regarding self-righteousness and he wrote in God's eyes you are holy and righteous But we often confuse holy and righteous with self-righteous. You get that? In other words, looking at yourself more highly and thinking of yourself more highly than you ought to think. And saying, because of my Christianity, I'm better than you. Truth is, we're all saved by grace through faith. Through Through the act of God, through Jesus Christ, death, burial and resurrection. Nothing to do with you. The only righteousness you have is righteousness in Christ. But it has to be consistently mixed with grace and mercy, forgiveness, and an opportunity for another to find the same forgiveness and grace that you did. He says, it says, we just need to understand the difference. One definition definition says that self-righteous means having or characterized by a certainty, especially an unfounded certainty, that one is totally correct and morally superior. Now, there's a definition broadly stating the theology or the ideology that political correctness gives people the right to judge you. Because one definition says political correctness is the mindset that everything you do, everything you say, and every opinion that you may state has to fit a preordained format. In other words, if you don't think the same way I do, then I'm going to persecute you for it. Now, all you need to do is turn on the news and you'll see it every single night. It's getting so old now where everybody's beating everybody to death on political boundaries for not thinking the same way they do. And they mock everything that is done by one party toward the other. Now, as a believer, as a Christian now, I'm also a man, I'm also a husband, I also have the same things that I have to carry on in life and maintain, same decisions I have to make, you have to make. 
The difference is when it comes to my Christianity, it must be practical or it's no good for anything. If my Christian walk is a man, I, can't, I don't know what it's like to be in a woman's mind or a woman's body. But my mother raised me so I, I could see the, the great positives of being a mother and the great negatives of being a, a, a mother without a, a husband. Without that man in the house, T.D. Jakes just did a great thing, um, woman thou art loosed, and then he turned over and he said, you know, when David came into Ziglag, he came to redeem back and to get back the women and the children. The enemy didn't take the men, they took the women and the children. And when they all come back, the men are all screaming and saying, what are we going to do, what are we going to do? And David cried and David said, pursue and recover all. And he went on to explain, he said, Satan didn't kill the women and children. Obviously, they were being kept for another purposes slavery in general but brother jake's brought up an incredibly interesting point and it's on the youtube if you want to find it i'll put a link up on the website so you can look at it but then he switches he said woman thou art loosed is great david could have been the first one that ever could talk or preach about woman thou art loosed but he said i want to talk about the men because the women were were incarcerated they were locked up they they were they were set aside but the enemy didn't want to kill the women they wanted to kill the men. And knowing that the man would come after the woman, they would, sl they would slay the men and therefore there'd be no inheritance in the family. There'd be no, no, no other way of reproducing or, or, or developing or building the tribe. He went on to explain that although women have a, a, a fabulous function within that, what good is a home without a man? And he said a lot of women have no experience with a man other than one particular experience. But they don't know what it is to hear the voice of a man that loves them and wants to defend and protect them. There's an absence of men. The men are being killed off. Then he went in to describe an interesting statistic that in, in medical situations, the men, the young male children die earlier than the women do. More men die in infancy than women die in infancy. The young girls die in infancy. Herod wanted to make sure that he made sure there was, a, there was no male Jesus to take the kingship. So from the age of two and three years old, he said, slaughter every male child. I want to make sure that he doesn't reach the point where he becomes viable as a minister or viable as a priest or viable as a messiah. And so the enemy's strategy has been and always will be, kill the men, and you'll kill the lineage. This is a subject that I know, you know, if people don't think, you know, they can very easily get offended and think that, oh, and he's banging away at women. I'm not. I wouldn't be here if it had not been for a woman. And we could go into a whole study in 1 Corinthians where it talks about the man is not for the woman, the woman for the man, all that. What is he saying? The unit that creates the most powerful offspring, the most powerful uh, fruit of any connection is a wholly developed family unit. The husband, the wife, coming together, reproducing after their own kind and creating a family unit which goes on and reproduces after its own kind and inhabits the whole earth with men and women who have godly divine principles. And that's not happening anymore because we're failing to see that the male without the female is pointless and the female without the male is pointless. Lest the earth run down and nobody ever get born. And normal thinking people would recognize that and say that if I'm not able to reproduce, what's the purpose of being married? Because that was God's initial intent. Reproduce, fill the whole earth, you see. Take authority over things. And he gave certain functions to the man and certain functions to the woman. Now, in the generation we're in now, you're being bombarded with a whole lot of, you know, teachings that are designed to cause you to change the way in which you think as a Christian. I hope I'm not digging myself into a deeper hole here, but if you understand God's perspective, he wants you to see what they're doing out there. And instead of just saying, oh, well, I kind of agree with it, don't agree with it because it's wrong. I happened to flip through Facebook the other day and I, 
I came across Jim Taft's comment on something and it was, it was absolutely correct. And I went back half an hour later, he must have had 10 or 15 people slamming him. On this, I felt like getting into a fist fight with them for you. Because their thinking is, is, is carnal thinking. And these are Christians that are responding to him, even his own family. Saying, you're self-righteous. <laughs> and Jim was saying, how can I be self-righteous if I'm taking God's side? God said that. I didn't say that. God said that. And therefore, because God said it, I, I'm in agreement with it. Well, that makes me a racist. Makes me homophobic. See? Makes me less than all-inclusive. I'm not all-inclusive. But I am to love people. I'm not to criticize and judge people. But I am trying to bring representation to you of what God thinks about certain things. And you'll find that very few ministers will get into what's called the woman thing. I don't mind skirting around it. But every time I do, boy, look out. You get smack in the side of the head. And I have... If people ask me, what do you think about women? I love women. What's the alternative? Please. <laughs> yeah. I'm married 42 years. Oh, we have a terrific marriage. No, we fight now and again too. We don't always agree on everything. But we're still married. Amen. People that know me have come to my house and gone, oh, brother. Because Satan has been on my tail ever since I accepted the work of the ministry. And he has the same operandi. The same motivations drive that stake between the husband and the wife. And that goes all the way back to Eden, doesn't it? And I tried to explain to you that couldn't have happened except for the fact that God created Eve out of the rib of a man. God created Adam directly. When God saw, now this is just Bible, come on, common sense. He needed something. And when he created Eve, he created a recreation. A creation from a creation. When, when, when Adam saw it, he went, woo-hoo, I like this. There's not a man in the room that still doesn't go, woo-hoo. See? Because women are uniquely created to fulfill the need a man has for something other than patting a dog or an animal or a, or a goat. Right? That's if you're normal. Eh? And so Satan said, I've got to bust this up as fast as I can do it. I can't get to Adam because he'll see me, he'll see through me in a, in a heartbeat. Where was he? We're not told. He must have been fairly close by. And God's only requirement of Adam was, you two rule and reign the garden together. But the authority was originally given to Adam. Adam's job was to tend the garden, look after the garden, and also keep an eye on what things were going on in his own household as well. But they were ruling and reigning together, which is what all you ladies want, right? You want to rule and reign together. But the clue is, you can't do it on your own any more than a man can do it on his own. If he's married, he has to start sharing that responsibility with his wife. And men like me don't do that easily. Because we don't see things as fungible or movable or adaptable, see. My, my personality sees black and white, sees right, wrong. Now, as a Christian, I have to look through God's eyes and say that there's a factor you're missing, Robin. I say, what's that? The grace of God. <laughs> if it were that easy, you could just say, off with their heads. <laughs> right? But mercy comes into it, because then you're going to look in a mirror and say, God said, I could easily have said that about you. Right. Off with your head. Yeah. But Lord, yeah, but you've given me as much problem as anybody else has, son. The fact that I called you into the work of the ministry doesn't absolve you from the obligation to make sure that you do things the right way. And you're going to make mistakes. While you're single, God holds us to a different, a different uh, a level of, of, of recognition. And Paul reminds us of that. You know, When you're single, you ladies, you've got an opportunity to do things your own way. Can women be in ministry? Uh, well, my wife just got up here. I mean, we've had examples over and over again. Women come up here all the time. Ladies come up here and share their hearts, share the gospel. 
which is good. But you notice most of the time I try to get the husband and wife to come together. Why? Because one will have one opinion, another have another, and they balance each other out. Am I wrong? But what we're seeing now is a different thing altogether. The Bible actually says, I suffer not the woman to exert authority over the husband. Well, somebody asked me the other day, well, my wife's the pastor. Therefore, my wife is exerting authority over me from the platform. Ordinarily, that's not a problem as long as what she's saying is what God has said. But if you find a situation like you have one that's being affected by certain influences and her opinions are altered by her feelings and her emotions and she's enforcing those over her husband, she's out of order. Now, yes, some ladies in there say, well, what are you talking about? That spirit is exactly what I'm talking about. And if you think I'm, I'm from left field and I just fell out the back of a turnip truck, then keep doing things. If you know what I'm telling you is affecting you and your life and your marriage, keep doing it the way you're doing it and see what happens. Because I'll tell you, there's something in a man you can't drive out of him. Something God put in him. Anybody tell me what that is that separates him from women? His ego. A smart woman knows how to build up a husband. Start tearing him down and see what happens. Start making him feel worthless, useless, weak. And a lot of women compensate by that by marrying a weak man. And then you start complaining because he's not a breadwinner and he doesn't take charge and he doesn't answer the front door. Forget about taking out the trash. And understand something else too. I was born in Australia and rightly or wrongly, my opinions were affected by that. If you go out in the bush in Australia, in the outback, women out there have a lousy life compared to American women. But you try to take them and bring them in here, they'd say, you're nuts. I'm quite happy getting up at four in the morning and cooking for a bunch of men who go out to work all day and picking them after them. Because that's the way they were raised. Now I'm going to get myself into trouble here. Because I'm an American woman. And you can shove it. All right, that's fine, shove it. In the Christian environment, however, you have an obligation to discover what it is that God considers to be correct behavior. And then the husband and wife have an opportunity then, if they have children and they're fortunate enough to have children, to raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the home. And the wife in particular, the wife with the daughters and the husband with the daughters, has each a role to play to encourage those daughters to be raised in a way in which they won't disappoint themselves or you. There's nothing wrong with being married. But your expectations have got to be realistic. <laughs> the divorce rate amongst charismatics is four times what it is in the world. Did I say something wrong, sweetheart? Something in your eye? Oh, thank God. <laughs> That's normally a clue when the tissue box comes out. Let's get into the book here. <laughs> you know, when I first decided to marry my wife, I thought, I, I better marry this one because no one else is going to want me. <laughs> you ladies, are, and I'm not backpedaling, I'm telling you the truth. Thank God for them. Thank God for the ladies. Thank God for a wife that's devoted enough to her. I ask my wife all the time, do you love me? What are you talking about? Because I'm sometimes amazed that any woman could really love me because I got a, a predisposition to being very, very hard. But the good point of that is, I promised my wife when we got married, you'll never want for anything. And I will defend you as long as I know you need defending. Sometimes men don't pick up that the wife needs someone to protect her. And I think some of the reason that women have become so hard, hearted, a lot of women, not all, but a lot of, is because they've never had a man that's truly a man in the house. Give us a chance. You know, inside all that, inside that great big male body that you're married to is a little boy that needs encouragement and understanding. And if he was raised in a home where that was dysfunctional and you marry a dysfunctional man and you came from a dysfunctional home, look out, the enemy's got a playground there. 
So that's, as Christians, why we come together to learn the kinds of things that please God. And then to resist the temptation to get up on your back legs and tear the shreds out of your husband. Try, try buying a $26 crock pot and see how that affects a man when he comes home. I'll tell you. <laughs> He'd be crawling around saying, I love you, baby, love you, baby, love you, baby. <laughs> that was the best pot roast who ever did make me turn into a blubbering, slobbering. Know what I'm saying? Where was all this tenderness? It's there. Where did I ask you to go? 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. I hope I'm not coming off like grandpa, am I? Because if anybody ever seen me around a young girl, I'm very protective. And I, I goo-goo with the best of them. It's just, I'm sorry that so many Christian women don't feel protected enough to be able to be themselves instead of having to put up this barrier and this shield that, that, that continues to reinforce I can't trust him I can't let my heart open to him I can't let my guard down but the truth is most of the time you can't but in the environment of the local house of God you ought to be able to learn what it takes to both defend myself and have the Holy Spirit watch over me at the same time be that tender quiet spirit which the Bible says through the Apostle Paul is of great price before God It was the tenderness that I, I saw in Cheryl when I met her that turned my heart to water. And she had a knockout figure and all that kind of stuff, yeah. <laughs> oh, she really did. Gorgeous. And a man likes to know that everybody's looking at his girl, you know. Saying, boy, she's beautiful. I say, I know. <laughs> but whatever beautiful is to you, it really doesn't matter whether it's outside or not. What turned me to her was her tenderness and her softness. And I've got to be careful because if I'm so hard all the time, she loses that softness. I told her the other day, don't lose your tenderness. If I ever start, you know, ticking off the numbers to you to the point where you start, you know, getting so self-defensive that you don't trust me anymore, you've got to let me know because I don't want to, I don't want to cause you to become hard. And being married to a preacher like me is not easy. I'll tell you that right now. And I am a hard man. I, I am hard. Yes, I am. And I, I cannot take. You must have in trouble again. I cannot take. I know. I know. Stop it, right? I can't take weak men. I mean, I mean, weak, sissy. I, I can't take it. And, the, and, and there's a bunch of soft men in this house. And they're the first ones to attack me. My first inclination is to push them up against a wall somewhere and say, man up. Acting like a woman yourself. <laughs> What's the matter with you? Got to sound like the guy in The Godfather. Yeah, that's valid. Thing. You ever know that? Shut up! Shut up! What's the matter with you? Oh, it's okay. Don't we? I don't want that to come off all much. I know it's being recorded, so I said it. Yeah, I said it. You tell me, what does a woman get married for if it's not to have... All right, yeah, you want to have someone to go home with and go out with and all that kind of stuff. But it's companionship, isn't it? And true companion ha companionship in my book has to be based on the knowledge of who I am and who you are. As a man who I am and as a woman who you are. And it's that that draws men and women together, isn't it, Patrick? If there's, if there, I told my, my, my nephew, most millennials are scared to death of getting married. They're putting it off later and later and later and later. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but it still comes down to the individual. But if you meet somebody that doesn't do that for you, what's the point? You've got to find the man that you meet to go out with as, boy, this guy makes me feel good. I like to put my arm around him. I like to hold his hand. I, I, I like the fact that, you know, when I go somewhere, he makes me feel like, you know, I'm special. But I also like the fact, too, that he, I just said, he says, Go out for dinner. Some girl said to me, well, I go out with a guy and the first thing he says, where do you want to go? She says, well, where do you want to go? Well, I don't, quite, I don't know what I want. I well, what time should I pick up? What time do you want me to pick you up? Well, what should I wear? I don't know. What do you think you should wear? I don't know. I got an idea for you. Get lost, will you, you creep? 
Oh, yeah, Mr. Macho, right? Hi, I'd really like to take you for lunch today. Would you mind? Would you, would you like to go? Out? Yes, I would. Okay, I'll tell you what. Uh, I'm going to pick you up at 12.30. We're going to go to such and such. Don't get all dressed up. It's just going to be casual. And I think you'll like it. It's outside. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful day. And, and, and we can sit and talk, get to know each other a little bit. And it's great food. And um, suit you? Yeah, sounds yeah, good to me. Now, you've told me where we're going, what we're going to eat, uh, what, what, I, what I should wear, right? And you've taken charge. Woohoo! We're off to a good start. And then, you know, you go out there and you find that I'm a creep, you know, and I'm saying all the wrong things at the right time. What have you lost? Nothing. You had a nice lunch. Now, 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 now it's your turn, right? Well, hey, baby, let's get together. I said, no, nah, I don't think so. Yeah, I'll tell you what, you, you can. You can, you can pick me. I'll, I'll give you a date. How about Sunday at 9 o'clock? <laughs> well, where are we going? Where do you want to go? That's where I, I always go. I got IGO. <laughs> I get some word of God into me. How about that? <laughs> Make sure you tell them a little earlier because chances are they're not going to show up. But that's no way to crawl up into a ball and say to myself, ooh, nobody loves me. No, no, no. You're just making a stand for who you are. Amen. Don't make the mistake of trying to make the person you find physically attractive, emotionally or spiritually attractive. If that's not there, forget about it. You've got to have the, you've got to have the zing, that thing, right? You've got to have that. But at the same time, you've got to, you can't get a relationship going with someone without like and precious faith. Good God Almighty, it's noon. And I haven't even gotten into what I'm talking about yet. First, <laughs> I'll give you a dollar later. <laughs> People say the right thing, I'll give you a dollar. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 14. Therefore, beloved, who's he talking to? Is he talking to the world? There's a time to talk to the world, but it's not on the Lord's day. I mean, yes, I can. I mean, there may be folks here today that are not born again. But if you came here today, it's because you came because this is the day that the Lord hath made, and I'll rejoice and be glad in it. I mean, we're still breathing in and out. The Marchmans and others have been here a long time. They've had a lot of opportunities to turn their back and walk away. I think they did once, but they came back again. And I think when God connects you somewhere, you stay, stay. Somebody said to me the other day, stay connected with a man of God that he connected you to, and he'll make sure you make it through. That's our job. Our job is to defeat the devil, not for you to attack me. Beloved, therefore, looking forward to these things, what things? Well, if you go back, you'll, you'll, you'll discuss, he's discussing there the interaction of the church with their leadership. Looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. So now, you know, he's headed somewhere here with the idea of uh, the communication between me and you ought to bring peace into your heart, not, not confusion and not disruption. Next verse. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord, the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. And, as, and also as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written unto you. Keep verse, keep going. As also in all the epistles... Speaking in them of these things, in which some things are hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist. There's a modicum of truth in every lie, if it's going to be effective. In order for somebody to get your attention, they have to hit on a subject which is interesting to you. But if it doesn't compare favorably with the Word of God, then you've got to ditch it. You can't adapt the Word of God. It won't adapt to anything other than itself. Amen. It's like a magnet. One way it repels, the other way it attracts. Opposite poles attract. So we've got to get to the point where the Word of God becomes the standard for you. Yeah? And even if it doesn't agree with the populace, to heck with the populace when it comes to agreeing with them. If their opinions aren't based on the Word of God, I can't agree with you. Huh. So in all the epistles, speaking in them these things, in which some things are hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do to the rest of the Scriptures. Now we're talking here about a failure to communicate. 
if folks don't like what the man of God is sharing, and what he's sharing is the word of the Lord or the word of God, in order to gain attention to their particular group, they have to adapt their teaching to agree with your mentalities. That's exactly what Satan did with Eve and what happens all through the generations and all through the centuries is preachers will eventually find a way to distort the truth in order to attract people to themselves. And here Peter refers to those as unstable people who are really untaught. I can't understand, honestly, how people can sit under the word of God for years and still not get it right. They have a propensity towards getting it wrong. I mean, how, how can you miss this over and over and over and over again? They hear it, but as Jesus said, often you've got ears, but you don't hear. <laughs> right? You've got eyes to see, but you still don't see. The reality of the truth that the kingdom of God is established upon a relationship that is personalized between you and the Holy Spirit, and that when you make mistakes, if you're quick to forgive yourself and repent and ask God to forgive you, he's just and faithful to give you another shot at it. I mean, to me, that's awesome. It's a no-lose situation. And yet folks are now being bombarded by the world's perspective of how things ought to be. And it sounds so good to them, they're trying to amalgamate what God's Word says as to what the world's general opinion is. The millennials do not like to be un un unliked or, or dissed or rejected. They'll make compromises as long as those compromises will cause them to have more connections. What do you call that in, in Facebook? More likes or whatever it is? I don't know. Friends. They're not your friends. Are you kidding me? <laughs> They're friends as long as you agree with them. And it's real easy to go down the list and unfriend somebody. <laughs> you know, don't like that one anymore. Don't like that one anymore. But what God's doing here right now, of course, is something totally different. I'm going to be running out of time here, so let's get the emblems together and we'll read something here together and then we'll partake together. Now, the whole purpose of what I'm going to share with you in three scriptures is this and it regards to the connectivity of the church in these last days. And I happen to come across something that has very little to do actually with the Lord's Supper except this reference to it. And it's found in Acts chapter 20. It's about a young millennial. And his name is Eutychus. And it says here that Eutychus was hanging around listening to a Bible instruction, a home Bible instruction. And it says that as Paul was ministering, I'll read it to you from verse 9. He says, he was in there preaching, <clears throat> and in the window sat a certain young man, that's why I call him a millennial, and he was named Eutychus. And True to his personality, it says he was falling asleep. Yes. You've got to watch millennials because they'll fall asleep on you. They're spent up all night doing Facebook. And, and they were tired. He's tired. And he, said, and he said he was sinking into his sleep even while Paul was preaching. I want to back up a little bit. Go to verse 7. I don't know how I picked 9. Did I say 9? This ties it down to the Lord's Day, Sunday. The first day of the week, a Sunday. And he said, They were gathered together when the disciples came together to break bread, getting ready to have communion. Now, Paul was ready to depart the next day. But Paul had a little bit of the same thinking that I did. While he's got you... He's going to continue to share things that are on his heart regarding the kingdom and regarding what the Spirit of God is telling him to tell you. So he started to talk and he spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. They went there to have the Lord's Supper and he started to preach and didn't shut up. And he says there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. Amen. They just keep adding more and more light. He kept preaching later and later. Now we got to the part where this young kid, Eutychus, he's starting to nod off 
And then he was overcome by sleep. And as Paul continued speaking, he fell out of the window and fell three floors. And when they got down there, they said, he's dead. <laughs> oh, boy. Is he going to get it for preaching so long people drop out of a window? And then they get killed. Next verse. But Paul, I love that, but. In the middle of preaching, some guy falls out of a third floor window and they say, he's dead, he's dead. And Paul says, oh, really? Was I that boring? I don't know. And he says, he went down and he fell on him. Literally, he fell on him. And he embraced him. And he said, don't trouble yourselves for his life is in him. Keep going. And when they had come up, they had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even until daybreak. And then he departed. Next verse. And they brought the young man in alive. And they were not just a little comforted. The whole circumstances here deal with young people, old people, all kind of people gathered together for the Lord's Supper. And Paul, knowing that he had to leave early the next morning, his consideration was with making sure that this unification, communion, supper, took place. Didn't even let a young man falling out of a window and dying to stop him, so he went down and raised the kid up from the dead. And God honored it. Now, the more I study about Paul, the more I realize that he was not a good preacher. Because other people were said, Paul, you need to go and listen to these people. They're hot, man. And he said, all right, I'll go listen to them. And he said, that didn't add anything to me. I don't know what's so he said he calls them these super apostles. <laughs> but people said, Well, they'd rather listen to the super apostles than listen to one who's actually called by God to be an apostle. Maybe one of the reasons why the kid was so sleepy was he'd been listening to the super apostles. And he Paul didn't quite do it for him. I don't know. Other scripture, real quick. You can hand out the, the, them. Now, what I'd like you to do, if you don't know this already, and you sh I'm sure you do, we keep these emblems separate. And we hold on to them. We don't take them individually. Because the Scriptures encourages us that one of the main precepts of the communion is to do it together as a family. Amen. Right? It's the one thing that we do together that reminds us of our completion as a family in Christ. This, of course little piece of unleavened bread or cracker type typifies the body of Christ. Unleavened, no sin. And of course, this is fruit juice. It's not Cabernet Sauvignon. It's fruit juice. And uh, it could just as easily be, you know, a little bitty thing of wine like that. You're not going to go to hell because of that. But what does matter is how it's taken. And with the resolution of your heart... 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 11 through 17. Read this one. Hold on to it now. Now all these happened, all these things happened which proceed in the chapter as examples, and they were written down for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. The history of the church is what he's referring to. Therefore, let he who thinks he stands take heed unless he fall. This is a constant re-education of yourself. It's self-introspection. This is something that's lacking in general in the body of Christ, which I've had to learn over the years to take very seriously. The willingness of each individual member of the body of Christ to examine themselves, independent of other people's examination, but examine yourselves. When you look in the mirror of the Word of God, how am I doing? How's my response? Is my response the way it ought to be? Am I treating other people with the same kind of respect that I want them to treat me? Have I moved and shifted into lying just to make sure that I can make some extra money? I mean, these are, these are checks and balances, oftentimes led by the Holy Spirit. But comparing yourself to yourself is a, is a mistake. Because you'll convince yourself that you're justified in whatever action you want to come up with. 
But if I look at the Word and compare what I'm living, how I'm living, what I'm saying, what I'm doing with the Word, then there comes an opportunity for conviction of the Holy Spirit, which is a good thing. Self-sharpening. No temptation has overtaken you, such as is common to man, but God is faithful. Everyone say, God is faithful. God is faithful. Who will not allow me, he will not allow you, to be tempted beyond what you're able. Isn't that awesome? But with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear. It's like my father would never let me have a motorcycle. I found out later on because he used to date my mother. with a, He had a motorcycle with a little sidecar. He used to pick her up in that. But he had such a bad accident one day, it nearly killed him. He ran under the front cow catcher of a, of a tram. And so from that day on, he said, no, he said, these things are dangerous, it'll kill you. So I'll never let you have a motorbike. But what I will do is that I'll do something else. And I forget what it was now. He helped me get a canoe or something. So I could go paddling up the canoe by my, up the river by myself. So knowing that I was so stupid that I would surely put myself, you know, into a tree or something with a motorcycle, he swapped it out and gave me something which was less invasive and less dangerous. So in some way, God is like my father. He said, he will not allow you to be tempted be one what you're able. Because I really wanted that motorcycle. I wanted my ride on my back on my friend's motorcycles. Went across the Harbour Bridge at 130 miles an hour. Stoned. I mean, crazy. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. That was way before I got born again, by the way. But with, I've got to tell people this. And they think, oh, yeah, he was stoned. But here I am. I haven't smoked and doped in 35 years, 34 years. Thank God. But I can smell it within a mile away. <laughs> but with the temptation, will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So my canoe was my way of escape. How has God done that with you? He's obviously exchanged something that was less dangerous. Next verse. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. And this is all to do with the Lord's Supper. What is idolatry? Well, he tells you. Anything idolatry is anything that has become a god to you that is an anthema to the service or the worship of God Almighty. Anything can become your god. Flee from idolatry. Next verse, please, real quick. As I speak to wise men, judge for yourselves what I'm saying to you. See, look at yourself in the mirror. Next verse. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Keep it going, please. For though we are many, we are one bread and one body. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say that to them. Although we are many, Although we, are many we, are one bread we are one bread and one body. And we, and we all partake of the one bread, the one bread. which is Christ. Jesus. Next verse. Observe Israel after the flesh. Are they not those who eat the sacrifices of the partakers of the altar? He goes on and describes here of all of the different things that people have missed the mark in and that they made them their idols. He's saying even though Israel has a habit of doing these things, it's actually idolatry. So make sure that when you serve and when you have communion, you do so with recognition that the one living God whom you serve is made available to us through and by the death, burial, resurrection of the Christ. Can you say amen? amen. Now it says in 1 Corinthians 11 as we move on, I haven't got time now because I'm out of time. If we're to read the 1 Corinthians chapter 11 all the way through, it takes you through the process of, of how Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper what it represents as to his body and his shed blood in the, to, as to establish and convene the New Testament. But then he goes on and says that a lot of people have fallen sickly and because they have taken the Lord's Supper without due consideration of what it really represents, which is the connection between you and the Christ. And it says, take time before you rush into it that you get your heart right. If you've got ought against anybody, forgive them, release them, as Christ also forgave you. Then he goes on further into that and starts explaining some of the ramifications of people who have misunderstood that covenant. It gives us pause, ladies and gentlemen, to recognize that when you and I come together in this, in this house and begin to share the word of the Lord, and even now, you know, falteringly, I tell you that there are going to be a lot of issues that the Spirit of God is going to begin to stir up and raise up so that you can be educated concerning what the strategies of the, of the enemy are. Now, if we continue 
to allow the world system to dictate to us by through political correctness or any other other way. What is acceptable to us versus what is acceptable to God. And we choose the friendship with the world over the friendship with God. We'll find ourselves in error very quickly. So our best defense is the understanding of the strategies of the devil. Is it not? I've always said this. In order to know what not to do, first of all, you've got to find out what the strategies of your adversary is. If you're going to win a football game, what do they do? They, dis- they, they search out and discover the, the strategies or the, the, the moves of their, of their opponent's team so that when they're put in motion, they're already aware of what they're going to do and then they can make adjustments. I want you to be able to be quick to make adjustments to what the world system is pouring out on you. You may not see it, but it's like a shower. Everything that's coming at you in the world system with the world's communications, (laughs) false news, all of this stuff is designed to get you to think a certain way and to get you to turn away from what the Word of God says. That's why I'm here to make a stand with you. Communion is what we do to establish ourselves in that family connection. We're all supposed to be working one with the other. To bring a blending of both that which we know and that which we don't know. So that together we can raise the level of the spirituality of the house of God in which you belong. If I could say one more thing to you, saints of God, it would be this. Try to maintain your recognition of which kingdom you are looking at. Which kingdom doctrine you are listening to. Is it the kingdom of this world? Or is it the kingdom of our God? They are both kingdoms. They both operate on spiritual principle. The spirits that control them are on opposite ends, and yet they are still spiritual in their content. God is spirit. The difference being, of course, that God created Satan as an archangel. And the creator still has power over the creation. Let me thank you for your faithfulness. And I hope that, you know, the opportunity of having dialogue is really, really important. As a man, I'm just as capable of making mistakes as anybody else. But I spent, I was up early this morning studying to make sure that my perspectives were accurate. The reason being, I have to take responsibility for what I teach you. If I teach error, that error is going to come pounding back on me. But I tell you this, that there is a change happening in the atmosphere that's global. And I want to be sure that where I'm headed is not only in the right direction, but in the right way. So thank you for being quick to forgive me if I tend sometimes to be a serrated edge instead of a velvet cushion. I'd like to be a velvet cushion, but velvet cushions are made for heads. What I bring you is better for your heart. So Father, in the name of Jesus, for the men and the women that are gathered into your house, I give you thanks. Because it takes a peculiar people, as Peter said, a royal priesthood, a chosen generation to be understand what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. And our desire, Father, is to hear your voice and to know exactly what's being said and know how to adjust and how to adapt to it. Each one of these blessed saints, because that's what you call them, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we have an obligation to each other to make sure that if one falls, then the other will pick them up. And not to criticize, not to judge, but Father, at the same time, to continue to be seekers of truth and knowers of the strategies of the wicked ones so that we can counteract them. I bless them, Father. I bless them for the knowledge that in these last days, so many things seem like they are conveniently correct. Help us, Father, not to take that which is convenient over that which is corrective and that which is necessary as you spoke to your son Timothy Paul said my son in the faith reprove rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and don't be turned away by what others may have to say about you 
But remember this, that your hands were laid upon you and prophetic statements were made over you and spoken over you. That your destiny in God is not dependent on the agreement of others. And if you're going to find agreement, saints of God, find it with the Spirit of the Lord and find it with the Word of God and find it with the peace in your heart knowing that He has begun a good work and you will also complete it. I bless them, Father, today. I bless them for the desires of their heart, for the works of their hands, for the humility of their life structure. And for the knowledge, Father God, that whatever good thing you have prepared for them, Father, it shall come to pass. Let them leave this house, Father, with faith, with strength, and with integrity, always expecting the blessing of the Lord to discover them whenever they need it. Let your provision be found. In Jesus' name and all the saints of God said.